bench like me. I once was lost, but now I found a love of God, but now I see. Everybody was talking and laughing and sharing experiences, and it was such a blessing to hear that we come together as brothers and sisters and we can fellowship deeply from our hearts. And it's such an encouragement, not only for me, but for, for each other. And so, um, man, it's so awesome to be here this Sunday morning, praising and worshiping our God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so as most of you know, we like to open up with a bit of the word uh, as we worship. And the word this morning comes from 1 Peter <coughs> chapter 2, in verse 24, where the word says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Amen. <clears throat> and so that is such an awesome thing to think about that. The Bible says that God made he who knew no sin, Jesus, the perfect and holy one, to become sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. And so we no longer live to sin or for sin. Instead, we live for righteousness. So the choices we make, the words that we speak, is all should be all in righteousness. And Jesus did that. Uh, and, and his wounds is what heals us, heals us spiritually so that we can have eternal life with our Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning and, and pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you as your children, Lord. And we are humbled, we are thankful, and we are excited to be in your presence, Father. And we come before you for the throne of God. And we open up our hearts and our minds and our ears to you, Lord. We pray that you speak to us. We pray that Whatever it is you want to share with us this morning, that we have the ears to hear. 
We pray that we can share the love that you have for each one of us with one another to edify the body of Christ, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to love on one another. We thank you for this opportunity this morning to do exactly that. But also, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you and to praise your holy name. We lift our voices up to you this morning. We lift our hearts up to you, Lord. We give you all of the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we pray in your son, Christ Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. and amen. 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 Pastor Jason, how's everybody this morning? It's a beautiful Sunday morning. Did you guys know that God calls you friend? Amen. Let's sing to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, 
Let us pray and give thanks to God. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we just come here before you, Lord, Father God, with open arms, Lord. We just thank you, Father God, for bringing us here, Lord, from last week to now, Lord, Father God. All the trials that we have been through, Lord, you have overcome it, Lord. We have overcome it, Lord, Father God, with your help. We thank you, Lord, for our jobs, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for our finances. We thank you, Lord, for our water, Lord, Father God. The simple things, Lord. Our food, Lord, our shelter. We also thank you, Father God, for our freedom, Lord, Father God. Where we can make choices today, Lord, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for healing us, Lord. For healing our family healing our children, healing our parents, and us too, mothers and fathers, Lord, Father God, that go through turmoils to daily, Lord, Father God. I also ask you, Lord, for forgiveness, Lord, because many a times we make bad choices, Lord, Father God, make choices that corrupt or make disagreement between husband and wife or Parents and uh, um, parents and children, Lord Father God. Thank you, Lord, for all of these stuff that you blessed us with. And also, Lord Father God, I ask you to bless all the ministry, Lord Father God, in this church. Bless all the pastors. Bless Pastor Ray and Sister Lani, Lord Father God. I also, Lord, ask you to be with the person that's going to be preaching. Pastor Kim, the preaching the word, Lord Father God, may somebody here hears it and 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 need it, Lord Father God, touch their heart. Lord Father God. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. amen.
If you're happy to be here and see the Lord, give him a All right. Good morning, New Hope Volcano. Good morning. Good morning. So nice to see everyone. You know, um, I was having a conversation this morning um, about worship, and we were talking about how different churches, different denominations, different people worship in different ways, right? Sometimes people stand straight like this, and they worship, and they don't, they hardly blink sometimes, you know? And sometimes people worship with their hands in the air. Sometimes people worship with one hand, like they're giving uh, God a high five. You know, all different types of ways to worship. And so um, I kind of was wondering about that. I was thinking about that, like how we worship. And um, what does the Bible say about that? Is there a specific way to do it? I know I've shared with you in the past that I never used to enjoy worship. And I would make Stacy late to worship when I first got saved. And um, so when I first, first started coming to church, worship for me was exactly like this. I wouldn't even move my lips. And I would just stand here and I would just watch worship. And then it evolved from that to me whispering a little bit, praising the Lord in a little whisper. And then it evolved to me singing softly to myself and then eventually clapping and then eventually raising my hand and lifting my heart to the Lord and so grateful to uh, have the ability to praise our Lord. Um, but I, So then I looked up a scripture and it was in 1 Timothy chapter 2, speaking of instructions on worship. Uh, in verse 8 it says, Therefore I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. And so when you come and you see some people lifting hands, some people not lifting hands. It's an individual worship. We all individual worship individually, but it's a time for us to come and to praise the Lord. And so I'm so grateful we had that opportunity this morning, uh, as we do every Sunday, 
So thank you, worship team, for leading us through worship this morning. Uh, so I have one announcement before I call our sister up for her announcements. And that is um, last week, uh, Pastor Ray and some of, some of you members were involved with this. And I wasn't. Um, there was a pastor appreciation last week. And so Pastor Ray, um, uh, you know, he, he allowed some people to speak and to, to give thanks. And so Pastor Jack and Mahi wasn't here last week. And so we want to honor them this week. But I want to say before we do that, Pastor Jack, go ahead, Isaiah. You can. What is so awesome and so amazing and what I'm so grateful for is not only Pastor Jack's heart for serving the Lord and being obedient to his calling and also being a, an awesome brother and a mentor here at this church, but it's cool when a pastor retires, right? Because you never retire. That's never going to happen until you go home to be with the Lord. But when they retire and they decide to, to choose a home church that they will come and attend and and sit and listen to the service. So I feel so blessed, Pastor Jack, that you and Mahi decided to choose this church. I hope it's not because it's the closest church to your home. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so I'm glad that you chose us. And um, I just thank Mahi and, and you for continuing to serve because that, that is a lifelong commitment unto the Lord. And so we love you and thank you, Pastor Jack and Mahi. We love you guys. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's it for my announcements. We have our sister, Chris. Thank you. God loves you. Wow, the band pretty, did a pretty good job this morning, huh? Yeah, big shoes to fill. Um, Monday, people will be getting together to pray for you. So if you have a prayer request, just put it in the lovely wooden bowl back there so that they know specifically what to pray. Wednesday, Bible study here, 5 o'clock with dinner. Uh, Thursday is hula at 5 o'clock here as well. Friday, yard ninjas are here at 8 a.m. out there working, making this place so beautiful. You can join them. Um, Friday night at 6 o'clock is Celebrate Recovery. Now offering child care. Drop your children and your junk. <laughs> um, men's ministry was yesterday, and it will be on November 16th. It's always the third Saturday at 9 a.m., including breakfast. Women's ministry is always the last Saturday, so that'll be October 26th at 8 a.m., only on Zoom. So if you'd like to join, you have to see Stacy. She'll get you the email. The thrift shop is open again. I heard a rumor. Um, the first and third Saturdays from 9 to 11. Is that correct? All right. You, 9 to 12. You can come and buy things or help them sell things. Yeah, I heard it's fun. Okay. Um, we're having a Christmas fair. So exciting. Um, so, you know, the other day I heard um, one of the other teachers at school say that his daughter is, uh, they picked coffee and they're selling coffee as a fundraiser for her to go on a, on a trip to New Zealand, I think. And I said, hmm, you know, I know where you could sell some of that coffee at our Christmas fair. So if you, you know, catch some people here that they're, you know, looking for some extra cash or have some things to sell, let them know. Right. I think we have about 20 so far. We only can take 30. So we need about 10 more vendors or so. Um, it's December 7th here in the youth room, the outer lanai and the inner lanai. And it's a great time. My husband's going to maybe make walking tacos. So that'll be good. Yeah. Come for the walking tacos. Stay for the fellowship. It's a fun time. Um if you know anybody who is interested, or if you're interested, all I need is their email address, and then I'll send them the information. Oh, and church people, it's um, free, free for church people, $10 for people who aren't included in the church. 
pretty cheap. Um, okay, we are currently on YouTube Live. Hallelujah. And oh, we have somebody watching from India on YouTube Live this morning. Hallelujah. And all over the world. Um, we are also at newhopevolcano.com. If you want some information, you want to see some pictures, I have some pictures of Auntie Sandra up there. I made her a special page. Um, also, you can share our weekly email, you can share our videos, you can share our website. Because all honor and glory are his. Amen. Yes, we did have men's ministry yesterday. That was awesome. Um, but we had such good fellowship. We only could read one chapter. Go figure, yeah? <laughs> we had planned for two, but we got one, one chapter. Um, and we got to fellowship and got to learn a little bit about some of the, the yard ninjas that are here and so we were asking you know how do you get your black belt you know and they said just show up and you get a black belt so if you want to join the yard ministry you can do that exactly that um i think that's it for announcements we're about to collect the tithes and the offerings like chris said we have a website newhopevolcano.com there's a hamburger menu on the top of the home screen uh you click on that there's a place that says give online give your tithe or your offering that way if you're in the building and you want to give a tithe or an offering we have the offering bowl in the back by grandma susie you can drop your uh, tithe or your offering into the offering bowl and of course we say all of that uh, because we want to say that if you're visiting us for the first time that you please go back on your money feel no obligation and just be blessed with what the lord has in store for you this morning if you're visiting us from another church we ask the same thing of you that you come and enjoy what the Lord has in store for you and take your tithe or your offering to your home church. If this is your home church and you participate in all of the awesome ministries and events that we have and uh, you want to give your tithe or your offering this morning, we ask that you please give with a grateful heart. Bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we have so much to be grateful for, Lord. For some of us, we are going through all sorts of different trials, situation issues, health problems. But the one thing that we can rest assured in is that we have salvation in our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. And so we rest our hearts and our minds upon that. And we find our joy in that, Lord. And we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your one and only Son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And that blood, that blood that was spilled, is what brings us all here. It's what binds us all together. And so we come, and we lift our hearts up to you, Lord. We honor you, we worship you, glorify you. We thank you for knowing all of our needs, for caring for us. Your word says that we should Cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And so we want to do that this morning. Whatever burdens we're carrying, we want to exchange yokes with you. Father, we thank you for providing for us in every way, for caring for our needs. We lift our tithes and our offerings up to you. We pray that you multiply it in abundance. We pray that we use it according to your will. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the word that will be delivered from our brother Kea this morning. We pray that you speak to him and uh, directly to our hearts, Lord, that your words may be etched on our hearts as we leave here this morning. Brother Kea, sharing the word of God with us this morning. Chip, chip. Love you, bro. How's Pastor Jason? He's so awesome. Good morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Amen. Full of the Holy Spirit, anointed, ready for the word. Hallelujah. So, yesterday, um, where's my wife? Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Okay. I was getting lots of feedback. 
That must be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> anyway, so how many of us here have had any experience gardening? Gardening, growing things, right? And we all know that growing things, you cannot, you can, but it's not going to work out. You cannot just take a seed or a, uh, um, a sprout or something and just put it in regular dirt and it'll grow, right? You have to cultivate the soil. You have to add nutrients to it. You have to take away things, right? So there's a lot of things that you have to do to cultivate the soil, to grow things that are good. So that's the metaphor that I'm using today um, because I think we can all kind of understand that a little bit. Um, I want to talk to you today about cultivating a very special plant, and it's called self-control. So if you have your Bibles with you or you have your e-Bibles, you know, the phone, um, you can go ahead and, or if you have notes, you can go ahead and look at Galatians 5.22. And if you see there, it says, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against these things, what? There is no law, Right? Now, I'm going to read it to you from the pigeon version. But if I stay tight with God, he give us plenty love and aloha for everybody. He make us stay real good inside. He help us so nothing bother us. He help us guys hang in there with other people a long time. He help us think about good, about everything that's good. And like do good kind of stuff for people. He help us. For do what we promise for do. He help us for make nice to people and do it or do them with a good heart. He help us for hold back when we got to hold back. Amen. No more rules that tell that you no can do all this kind of stuff. I will just tell you. That's translated to pigeon. Um, <clears throat> But he lists the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? And in this list of spiritual virtues, he mentions the gift of self-control. Now, I would say the, the gift of self-control is one of the most necessary gifts to cultivate, right? You know, you can't just go punch them in the mouth because they're acting silly. You know what I mean? Um, we have to cultivate that self-control. So I'm using the metaphor of gardening once again, um, since we all have a little experience there. So if you want to live the life of a disciple of Jesus or a Christian life without, with any amount of success, the bearing, Holy Spirit is just going crazy. Okay, that's it. Let's just worship. No, just joking. <clears throat> so the bearing of fruit, not mangoes, not avocados, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you got to cultivate that soil, and you really got to take the time to work that soil. It's not an overnight process. Hospitals, jails, divorce courts, Full of people who have one thing in common. They lack self-control. Yeah, I have lots of self-control right now. <laughs> Praise God. If you turn the, if you turn not the main volume, but the volume of this down. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Down, sweetheart, not up. Praise God.
They just never learned how to control themselves. Not just one part of the body, but the whole body. One thing I see that's common amongst many, including myself, is that we tend to wait around for it to manifest miraculously, right? And as if it just comes out of nowhere, right? Self-control is just poof, yeah. No, it's not going to manifest miraculously. Guess what? I'm here to tell you, if we just wait around for it to happen, it's not going to happen. I tried. If the seed of self-control is dropped miraculously from the sky unto uncultivated soil, right? Then it'll spring up, but soon wither because like that parable that we all know, right? The seed that fell on the rocky path came up, but it had no nutrients and it died quickly. <clears throat> you know, children are not born with self-control, right? That's why the first letter, first words that they ever learn is no, right? Self-control, like other things mentioned in this verse, are attributes that need to be cultivated in our children with the help and the strength and the assistance of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, we're going to address five things that we, as disciples of Jesus, need to do to cultivate the soil for this important fruit called self-control to grow it, and to ripen it. Are you guys ready? All right. Number one, you can fill it in that way. Know God's word. The number one thing to cultivate that soil, the number one type of additive that needs to go into there is you need to know God's word. And I don't mean memorize it. If that's what you want to do. Go for it. But you need to know what's in here. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul says something very familiar, right? He says to Timothy, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good word. So knowing God's word in the, uh, so knowing God's word in the very first thing is the very first thing on our gardening to do list. The very first thing to enable us to cultivate self-control into our personal garden is knowing this. So let's imagine that God's word um, is a line here, and this is your line, and what you're trying to do is, is, is line up your wheel with God's word, right? It's like car alignment in a way, okay? If you have bad alignment, what happens? The tires wear differently, correctly? Correct? And then guess what? Going down the road, right? We just... Okay? <clears throat> it causes a wobble. Then in the whole front end of the car start to shake and wear. And next thing you know, you got to replace tie rods and all that kind of stuff, right? Everything wears out. It's not a comfortable ride. My point is that there's two tires or lines. Those two tires or those two lines have to be aligned in the same way our will and God's will have to be in line. Because when God's will and your will is aligned, then this, this third line over here, which is your body, your body and your life are also going to be in line with God's will. Amen? It's like, you know, a train. Everything follows in suit. So there's God's will, your will, then your life or your body. When these three elements are lined up together, you know what happens? Peace, harmony. But you also have self-control. 
But when they're misaligned, oh, brother, buckle loose. You do not have self-control, and you're out of control. How many of you have ever been out of control? Many times. You know, I used to always, before I came to know Jesus, I used to always go get my tires from the side of the road. You know what I mean? And, oh, this one looked good. And then I put him on the car. and Same thing. That was my whole life, you know? So the first step in cultivating self-control is to know God's will. And the only way to know God's will is to know the word. The knowledge of God's word, which contains his will, guides us in the direction that God wants our wills to be, the way our bodies should go. You know, I've been asked before, can you tell me what God's will is? <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, can you read God's mind? You know, of course not. And they sit and they think and they wonder what it is. What is God's will? And it seems that the last place that they look for God's will is here. Then I asked them, when's the last time you read the word of God? And a common response is, well, you know, I really don't have a lot of time. I got to work. I got to do traffic and all this kind of stuff. And I try to, you know, and I do a little bit here and there when I can. You know what I mean? And then I think to myself and I say, well, no wonder you don't know his will. Because you don't know his word. I can stand here all day long and preach to you and you might get something from it, but you pick this up and you read this, you're going to get way more than I could ever give you. You got to know the word to know his will. And when our will is lined up with his, the direction, the body, everything else will flow and follow. When we're absolutely sure of the right direction, because we know it from God's word. And when we have this, then we have the strength to make our bodies follow that direction because we know it's here. Have you ever had that experience? When you're absolutely sure because you've read it in God's word? You're positively sure because you've seen it in black and white or red and white, depends on what version you have. What God wants you to do or what he doesn't want you to do. The fact that you're absolutely sure of it makes it easier to accomplish because you know you're doing God's will. Amen. When you know what God's will is for your will and your body, then you do have the courage to say no or to say that's enough and exercise control over yourself. You are in power of that. It's amazing when you're able to say to yourself, you know, that self-talk, right? We all have it, right? Uh, yeah, I better not do that. Or, mm, no, that's just wrong. I can't, you know, it's because God's word says this, right? This is what I'm talking about. Or, you know, the, the chapter and verse says, thou shall not kill. You know what I mean? Uh, the chapter and verse says, love your brother. Love your enemies, right? The only way to know God's will is to know that word and to read it and to study it and to hear it often. Quick testimony. It wasn't until I started reading God's word and actually I went to college. It was a, it's a long testimony, but Long story short, I went to college and took Bible. I had the college I went to, you had to take Bible classes um, because it was a Christian college. And so I was able to study the Bible from an academic point of view. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, did the doors and the lights, everything was just like, wow. Because I actually, because I dabbled before and you know, walked away from the Lord and everything, got saved, walked away, got saved, walked away. And it was because I was coming to church. I was fellowshipping with people and I was getting all this sugar. But I wasn't getting meat and potatoes. I wasn't getting this. 
So I would end up falling away, you know. But once I started digesting this, my entire life changed. So number one, you really need to know God's word. And I'm not saying word for word, but you need to know the gist of it. Number two, be aware of the danger of the lack of self-control. Be aware of that danger. Being aware of things helps you not to do them. <clears throat> so let's go to Matthew 5.29. Jesus says, your right eye makes you stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go to hell. You know, I heard a story once about a father whose son went and he joined the military when he was 18 years old. And he came back from basic training and everything. And of course, He's not the skinny little beanpole kid anymore, right? He's like, you know, buff, right? Because he just came out of basic training. And so lots of meat and potatoes and exercise and all that. That'll make you, you know what I mean? Kind of big. And <clears throat> he came back home and he said, hey, dad, let's wrestle. Right? Because he used to always wrestle a lot, right? And, you know, so they're wrestling and, you know, dad always had the advantage because he was bigger. So now the tables are turned, right? So you can imagine this wrestling match was not a pretty sight. Um, <laughs> basically, dad was turned into a pretzel, right? <clears throat> but dad had a secret move. His secret move was called the pinky death hold. The pinky death hold. It is a great equalizer. So his dad managed to find his son's pinky and all he needed to do was bend it just a little bit. And guess what? It all turned to dad. Dad ended up having control over everything. <clears throat> you get it? Sometime, somehow he got a hold of a place that allowed him to control his son's entire body. I told you this story because Satan works exactly the same way. He gets control of one little part, just one little part. And because of the lack of control in that one little pinky part of our lives, he takes advantage of it. And he's able to control our entire life. It is as if Satan gets that pinky death grip on us and somehow manages to move the entire body around because he's got a hold of this just little tiny part. So when he succeeds, he manipulates all the parts of our lives <clears throat> from that one part. So if you're a secret sinner, I mean, if you have a secret struggle with a certain sin and you abuse it, but it's a secret thing, right? Nobody knows. God knows. And Satan gets a hold of that. And because you have that weakness, because he's got a hold of you there, he makes you lie about it. And then your job begins to suffer up because of it. And your health begins to suffer because of that. It's a chain reaction. That hold that he has on just one part of your life. You see, once Satan controls one little part, he will try to control everything. Because if God doesn't control you, then Satan controls you. I hate to say it like that, but that's the truth. You know, many people who have abandoned the church usually have done so because there was something or some things that they could not control. And eventually that something took over their spiritual lives. And in time, it demolished it. My point is we have to realize that what happens to these people happens because a lack of self-control. And it happens to them, and it can happen to us. We are not invincible. The pinky death grip, remember it, the pinky death grip. 
We need to understand the danger of not having self-control. When Jesus says, better you lose your pinky than your entire body, recognize the danger of not having self-control. Recognize the danger of allowing Satan to worm his way into a part of your life to control to the extent where he controls other parts of your life, not just that one area. Number three, the third way to cultivate self-control, be prepared to suffer. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24 to his disciples, what should they do if they want to be his disciples? He says they have to deny themselves, pick up their crosses and follow him. I want to tell you that gaining self-control is a constant battle. And at times, it's painful, and it's a difficult battle. But God promises us, he promises us in here that it is possible. So let's visit 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Paul says what? No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to men. So in other words, there's nothing new. Whatever you're tempted by, whatever it is, greed, sex, lust, abuse, anger, whatever it may be, it's nothing new to God. Human beings have been tempted by these things for millennia. You have a better chance at winning the lottery in Hawaii, because we don't have one, than to have uncommon temptation. Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And here's the best part. Here's the kicker. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Amen. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Also, that you will be able to endure it. Now, that part right there kind of gets confusing to some people. It used to confuse me a lot, and I'm going to clarify a little bit. Sometimes you can escape that temptation, but sometimes you got to endure it. You cannot escape it. Notice he mentions both of those there. Sometimes there's a way to escape, but sometimes the only reaction is to endure. And like I said from the Pigeon, pigeon Translation, Hold back when we got to hold back. Some people who fail at gaining self-control <clears throat> over themselves fail because they think this fruit should come without a cost. It shouldn't cost them anything. When we realize that our bodies and fleshly mind will react violently, violently, when our will begins to exercise godly control in a strange way, it makes the effort just a little bit easier to handle. Amen. Peter refers to this uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. He says, he who has suffered has ceased from sin. He who has suffered has ceased from sin. So he's saying, I can tell that you're making an effort at self-control. Ceasing from sin because I see the suffering that you're going through. Endurance. You know, you can just turn around. It's your choice. You can turn around and say to the devil, I'm not going to do what you say, bro. I'm, I'm not going to. I say no. I say beat it. Be gone. And the devil says, oh, yeah, well, I got news for you, bro. I'm going to make your life miserable. And you say to your flesh, no, 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 no. I'm in charge of my will. My will is in charge of my flesh. And you're going to do what I say. Then your flesh answers back, oh, yeah, over my dead body. Because that's the way it is. Be prepared to suffer. But also, here's the caveat, here's the nugget, be prepared to rejoice 
as you see yourself set free from that slavery of sin, those chains. I was talking to somebody about Celebrate Recovery. Now, of course, everybody, you guys know I'm a Celebrate Recovery ministry leader, so I'm going to put my two cents in about Celebrate Recovery as much as I can. But we're talking about things in general and started talking about addiction and, you know, how it um, is such um, a problem in society and some of the programs that are out there to help people with addiction. And I, this person says to me, the programs are great, but there's never any reference to God. You know, there's a reference to the higher power, but they never describe that higher power as God because they don't want to offend anybody. So the programs for those who are addicted usually helps them deal with that addiction. Praise the Lord. One day sober is better than 20 days high. They aim at what's called sobriety so that someone who is an addict of whatever it can, it can be can get to the point where they say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict or I'm a sex addict or whatever they identify with. You know, I've been sober for three years or I've been sober for 20 years or six days or 80 days or whatever it is. The goal is sobriety and that is an excellent goal. But in Christianity, in Celebrate Recovery, the goal is not sobriety. The goal is deliverance. You know the difference between sobriety and deliverance? Sobriety is always living with the desire to sin, but fighting it off. Deliverance is no more desire to sin. I can stand here all day long and tell you about the things that I've been delivered from, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm talking about, you're welcome. Um, but what I'm talking about is deliverance. That's what... Jesus, the that's, uh, sorry, that's what Jesus, the one and only true higher power, offers people. He offers deliverance, not just sobriety. But if you want to get that deliverance part, guess what? Get ready, be prepared, you will suffer. If you're willing to go through the suffering, I repeat, those who exercise self-control have the joy of knowing and experiencing the peace and satisfaction that comes when their lives are perfectly aligned with God's will. In other words, they're delivered, right? That's what Jesus, Christianity, and Celebrate Recovery offers. I've been delivered from chemical drugs, 100%. I, it doesn't even cross my mind. That's Jesus. And that's through working my steps. You know, I still have, I'm sober, but guess what? My brain is just like yours. You know what I mean? I have the thoughts. I have the desires to do things that I know I ain't supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? But I'm sober from them. I haven't been delivered yet, but I'm working. God's working on it. I'm, you know, I'm working there. Anyway, so. How to, self, to cultivate self-control. Number four. We're almost done. Thanks for hanging in there. Pattern your life after winners. Very important. Pattern your life after winners. In other words, you want to fly like an eagle? No, hang out with the roosters, bro. Okay? Imitate people who are worthy of imitation, who have a proven record of success in spiritual maturity and living. Paul the Apostle describes the, the people in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says in verse 6, you so became imitators of, of us, and the Lord having received the word and much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, 
but it also in every place your faith grows towards God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Wow. Paul and his workers set an example, an excellent example for the new converts in Thessalonica. They copied his example and they became models for other churches through the region. Now that's on a large scale, right? They copied the apostles, they copied the churches. So what kind of Christians do you think your children or grandchildren are going to be? They're going to be the kind of Christian that you are. Amen? And that's the kind of Christian that they're going to be. Why? Because the model that they have to follow. Amen? Please don't think that they're going to be more faithful or more devoted or more hardworking or, and more of this and more of that than you are. They're learning spiritual DNA that you are sowing into them. The DNA of their Christian experience. You're sowing that into them. These people here in Thessalonica were pagans. And the change in them was due to the fact that they modeled their behavior on what they wanted to become. Not what they were. The same principle holds true today. We need to have fellowship and we need to pattern ourselves after people who have succeeded in Jesus's teachings. We must imitate those who themselves have gained control in the areas that we're trying to gain self-control. I go back to um, the thing when I was uh, really, really bad with lust. I hung around with Christians who were strong, who didn't indulge in lustful activities. And this is the way that we can learn how not to do it. And we can receive encouragement from those who have succeeded spiritually. Celebrate recovery. We do it all the time. If they were sexually impure, I would have, I would never, I'm sorry. If they were sexually impure, guess what? And I was hanging out with them. I wouldn't have overcome it. But if on the other hand, we have fellowship with those who walk in the light, who will hold us accountable, who will encourage us doing what is right instead of excusing our vices. Then we begin to resemble that positive example, but not before that. So if you want to fly like an eagle, hang out with eagles, not roosters. They don't even sound the same. <clears throat> How they fly, because, you know, you want to hang out with the, the, the eagle because they can fly. Because guess what? Roosters can't fly. They can take off for a little while, but they can't soar. Okay? <clears throat> number five. Yay, we're there. And finally, number five. In order to cultivate self-control, you need to pray. Prayer. In Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 43, Luke writes about, writes the following. He says, Jesus came out and proceeded as, he, as it was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. And when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you, what, may not enter temptation. I repeat it again. Why is it? that we fail in self-control because we succumb to temptation. So listen, what he says, pray that you may not enter temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he began praying saying, Father, if you're willing to remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. So here's Jesus, perfect, without sin. He knows God's will completely, inside and out. Yet he was tempted. 
And his response to these times of testing was to pray and ask for strength to do what God wanted him to do. <laughs> he was God, but he still had to contend with a weak flesh. His spirit was willing, right? It was his body that needed the help. It's kind of the same thing with us. I would dare to say I'm looking at everybody here, and I know most of you here pretty well. <clears throat> and on YouTube, those are there that are there. In your heart of hearts, I don't think there's a person here actually who wants to sin. Amen? I really don't think so. Who says, man, I can't wait to leave the building. I can't wait to go home today, you know, and do something bad. I'm going to go turn on that, that, that computer and go watch some porn. You know what I mean? Or uh, I'm, I'm going to go to the bar and go get drunk. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. Right? Nobody's thinking that they're anxious to go and sin. But most people are saying, you know, I want to avoid that stuff. But sometimes circumstances are ignorant and so on and so forth. We fall to temptation. The spirit inside is willing to do what's right. It's the flesh that double crosses us. Amen. I want you to notice something about Jesus' situation. He knew God's will perfectly. He had done God's will perfectly. Excuse me. Yet he still prayed for the strength to continue. It makes me think that this wasn't the first time that he prayed and that kept that keeping his human body under control required effort. Lots and lots of it. Just like the rest of us. Do we ever make that prayer? You know, the one where, you know, by heart, lead us not into temptation. Yeah. You know, the Lord's prayer, right? Do we just think that that that's like a closing thing? No. How many times do we say that prayer? How many? Lots and lots, right? How many times did we say to God, Lord, I am so weak. I am fragile, Lord. I am nothing. I'm dust. I'm less than dust. Please, Lord. Have you ever cried out to God in prayer and said to him, God, please, can I just have one day where the sin stuff is down to a minimum? Can you do that for me, God? Will you do that for me? Lord, today, please help me to do just right things. Is that the nature of our prayer? Or is our prayer, could I have more, please? More, 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 and more, instead of giving in and finding excuses for our weakness. We should pray and ask for strength to overcome them. Because guess what? God will Give it to you if you ask. Some of you may be thinking, if I have to do all these things, how is self-control a gift? Where is the gift here? Sounds like a lot of work, amen? Self-control is the Holy Spirit's gift because he provides all the elements, every single one of them, to make it happen in your life. He provides the word of God. You got to know the word so your will lines up with his will. Who do you think gave us the word of God? The Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of a human will. But men moved by the spirit spoke from God. The Holy Spirit provides God's word, which reveals God's will without that which no man could know what was right or how to act. Amen. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is the one who what? He warns the conscience. You know that little voice? 
Everybody knows what I'm talking about. That little voice that says, hmm, brother, I don't think you should do that. You know better. Sometimes it's just a feeling. Right? You just get that feeling. It's like a resistance. You're going here and going there, and you're just thinking, oh, man, this just doesn't feel right. Who do you think is doing that? The devil? No. Do you think Satan is the one that will stop you from doing something stupid or wrong? No. That's the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit working in your life. Excuse me. Paul says in Galatians 5.17, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So what is it that you want to do? Right? I want to do what's right. I really want to. I want to obey God. I want to be a holy man. But guess what? My flesh and the world and Satan are constantly pushing against me. Who's pushing back? The Holy Spirit. Amen. The Spirit in me is pushing back. The Holy Spirit is the source of those warning bells, that signal. Danger, Will Roberts. Danger, danger. And all that, and, and that you're out of control. You're doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Right? Number three, the Holy Spirit strengthens your spirit for the fight. Remember I said it's not easy. It's not an easy thing. It's going to be a fight. You're going to scrap. And you're going to get beat up. You're going to get licking. But who do you think gives you the strength to come out for the bell in every single round? Right? Paul says in Romans 8.13, Pastor Jason, just for you, Romans 8.13, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will receive what? Life. If by the Spirit, not self-will, by the Spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the body. Overcoming one's fleshly desires is not easy. But we're not alone in the battle. Amen? The Holy Spirit works with our spirit to bring our bodies in line with God's will. Number four, he leads our leaders. You know, we have many leaders, many leaders, great examples to follow. You should pattern yourself with one of them. And I'm not saying to try to copy them. I'm saying to pattern yourself after them. Make sure you don't pattern yourself or your life on the life of a man or a woman who's been a Christian for six months. You should pattern your life, your ministry, your approach to things like one of the elders. One who's been an elder for 10, 20, 30 years, you know, who knows something about living this Christian life. Who do you think leads the leaders? Again. Paul says, be on guard for yourselves, speaking to the elders and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. In the end, the things you admire and imitate in others are those things which have been created in them by the Holy Spirit. Finally, last but not least. The Holy Spirit brings our prayers before God. And I pray sometimes, and I'm saying, God, I don't even know what to say to you anymore. Are you hearing me? Paul says the same in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, or we do not know how to pray as we should. We know how to pray, but we don't always know how to pray as we should. <clears throat> but then he says, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans, too deep for words. <sighs> the Holy 
Holy Spirit understands that, and he translates it. Yeah? I'm so at peace knowing that the Spirit is helping me to pray in a correct way before God. We can have confidence when we pray for self-control because our prayers are brought before God by the Holy Spirit himself. And so the ability to control oneself is definitely a gift from the Holy Spirit. It is. Because he provides all the essential resources that make it possible. All of them. And he provides them without charge. And in abundance. That's awesome. What a gift. Glory, hallelujah. If, if our lives are out of sync with God's will, it's usually because of ignorance of his word. Bottom line, the love of sin or disbelief. Amen. The lack of prayer. You know, we spend, you know, we may spend a lot of time rationalizing or justifying, but the reason usually lies within these things that I've just mentioned. If we got to rationalize, if we got to justify, it's probably not right. Because if we're lined up with this, if we know this, then we're lined up with his will, right? Self-control is something that's cultivated, right? It's just like making soil. And if you want that fruit to come out of that soil of self-control, you really got to cultivate it. You got to put the good stuff in there. Not just miracle grow, because miracle grow is not going to last. Okay? Self-control is something that's cultivated. And I've been talking about that this morning. <clears throat> so that um, knowing God's word and being aware of the danger, the consequences that are a result of lack of self-control by being ready to fight and suffer in order to win control by following leaders instead of losers. Instead of roosters, we follow eagles. And by praying constantly for God's help. Some people here today have already begun to exercise more self-control in the past 25 minutes because they believed at what I've taught and are already asking God for help in the battle to gain that self-control. And others have grown weaker because they've argued with the message in their heart or they found new excuses for their lack of control and refuse to see the danger that they're really in. My question to you, which group do you belong to? Are you getting better or are you getting worse? Have you gained something or have you lost something? If you need to, and you're feeling tugging, that's Christ. Put on Christ and make him the one who's in control. Jesus, take the wheel. Amen? Align yourself with him. Now, I, before I close congregation, I just want to um, talk about salvation. Now, if any, if you don't know Jesus, and there's something that I've said today, and it's really tugging on your heart, that's Jesus talking to the Holy Spirit, saying, hey, I love you. I really love you, and I want you to come home. I want to be your Savior. I want to take care of you. I want to teach you self-control. I'm going to say a prayer and I'm going to orchestrate the words for that prayer. You have to say it from your heart. Though. I'll just provide the words. So hang on to your thought. Now, there might be some people in here that have kind of steered away from God, kind of walked the other way and been, you know, upset for whatever reasons. They were not able to cultivate any self-control for a while and they kind of lost their way. I'm going to say this, the, that prayer. And I, um, I implore you to say that prayer with me because it's 
God is the God of not just second chances, but God is the God of many chances. And he loves you. And he wants you to come back home. So you can say the prayer with us. And then there's some of us here and online that have really, really been encouraged and their self-control is off the Richter. I mean, they got it down. I implore you to say the prayer with us also. Number one, to edify your spirit person. Number two, to edify those that are around you. <clears throat> because as I said earlier in the sermon, right? We need to put ourselves around people who are in self-control, who have the Holy Spirit in them, guiding them. So whichever one of those uh, three categories that you fall into, please bow your head and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner, and I haven't always done your will. I want to change that now. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and rose again on the third day for my salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. So now I say, so that I can hear me, so you can hear me, so that the enemy can hear me, and my neighbor can hear me. Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I will follow him forevermore. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me first. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the new souls that have committed to you. I thank you for the rededications that have come to you, Father. I thank you for the stewardship of this message, Father God. May it touch each and every heart that's here, Father. I ask that you send a hedge of protection around each and every person here and online, um, whether they hear it now live or hear it later, Father. I just ask that you cover them and send your ministering angels to speak to them at all times, but most of all, the Holy Spirit to help them s cultivate that self-control. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray, and everybody help me close by saying, amen. All right, so this is the end of service. Um, I know I'm not Pastor Ray, so I can't say it as eloquently as him, but um, it is the end of service. I'm not going to be upset if you leave while we're singing our last song. If you do choose to leave, um, you have things to do or whatever. It's a beautiful day out there. Please be careful. When you pull out to the main highway, people come flying around that corner. Lack of self-control. Okay? And so we don't want to be in the situation where we have to endure it. Amen? So please be careful when you go out there and you're driving. And um, if not, have a great week. And uh, God bless each and every one of you. Oh, yeah. Join us for lunch. Sorry. My favorite, peanut butter jelly. I saw kidding. them. I saw the sandwiches, okay? So, yeah, my stomach's going. All right. Oh, let's see. This dude woke up this morning. Ready? But don't you know that I woke up this morning with my mind set on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind set on the Lord. I woke up this morning with my mind set. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I'm singing and praising with my mind. Set on Jesus. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Set on the Lord. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Set on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I woke up this morning with my mind. Set on Jesus.
Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind set on the Lord. I woke up this morning with my mind set on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Be blessed. Aloha. Oh.